I am Kim Howerton, as uh, you guys already know, uh, and this is me before my journey started. A uh, hundred pounds heavier and pretty miserable because, I, as I, as was said in my intro, you know, I started on diets when I was eight years old. I um, pretty much developed my self identity as a fat person, and. I didn't want to be identified that way anymore. I didn't want to feel that way. But for as long as I grew up and just felt unacceptable, I didn't change a single thing. It wasn't until one day in my early 40s, I had a realization that I was going to die. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the next day, but sooner than I wanted, more painfully than I wanted, and probably more embarrassingly than I wanted, right? Like, there's just, you know, having vanity, it's, it's, it's good for some things. And it spurred me to say, I don't want this life anymore. And so I found keto. Other button. There we go. And so pretty much when I started keto, it was like, whoosh, downhill skiing, right? Uh, not that I do any downhill skiing, but I assume it goes pretty, pretty quick. Um, <clears throat> not especially athletic, this one. Um, but I just, law, the weight just started falling off. And I was like, what? How? I don't, is this familiar to anybody when you first started? You're like, what is this black magic? Have I made a deal with the devil that I'm not aware of? Because this is ridiculous. And it was a big party. We celebrated. Everybody, perfect, perfection had been reached, right? But no. So my blood pressure came down to 100 over 70. My fasting glucose was under 90. My A1C was under 5.3. My trigs were under 50. My HDL was over 90. Uh, my fasting insulin was under 6. And my C peptide was under 2. So all of the markers of metabolic health pretty much were great. And I looked very different, but I still wasn't quite there. So this is an experience that a lot of people have, I think. Raise your hand if you lost a good deal of weight, but you didn't get all the way to where you wanted. Right, okay. It's pretty much most of the people. Now, if you're one of the people that just whoosh your way to exactly where you wanted to be, I'm not jealous at all of you. <laughs> I wish you, bless your heart. So I just, <laughs> borrowing a phrase from my Southern friends, I think I'm using that right, uh -huh. all right? Okay, all right. But I was so happy to feel unencumbered. I could do things. I could move. I didn't worry if the bathroom stall that I needed to use at a location was going to be a little too small for me to move my arms properly within it. Um, but I still had weight loss goals. I didn't want to live my life at over 200 pounds. I just, I, I, that was something I felt. And so what happened? A lot of nothing happened. So this is my weight loss chart, right? And then a lot of gain, some gaining happened. First it just stalled out and then gained some, and I was like, this is not going in a direction I really approve of. And so, um, and then others of you, I just want to acknowledge that there are some people that come to keto and they don't have any downhill skiing portion. They're just here. They are just, they're like, they, they're advanced players. They start with the stall. They just go right into it, right? And what happens when you're in a long stall? My stall was years long. Not, it was, six weeks is not a stall, my friends. Just gonna say, a week, leave. Just leave, right? Um, but it was years. And I was like, is it this? Is it that? Is it this? Now, for those of you that are my age or older, this is Inspector Clouseau. I love Steve Martin, but he is not Inspector Clouseau. Agreed. And, uh, and Inspector Clouseau, we might know, makes some interesting conclusions. Right? Right? It's like, 
Well, I know the problem is that uh, my circadian rhythm's wrong, my this is wrong, my that is wrong, uh, my boyfriend is wearing the wrong uh, cologne, which is causing, right, like every little reason you go to and you're, but you know what it is. There's that moment you get to the, I know like this moment, like, yes, this must be it. Um, there's about 30 seconds of like, oh gosh, it's going to fix it all. A little bit of hope. Feels real good. There's not a lot of hope in the stall, right? I cannot tell you how much money I wasted in this stall paying people to try and fix me. Wasted that money. None of them really helped. You watch a lot of YouTube videos in the stall, right? Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. So you look at a lot of experts who have information for you in those YouTube videos. It's, it, it's that your GKI is wrong. It's that your blood sugar is wrong. It's that you're, no, you're using sweeteners. No, you're using dairy. No, you're, use, you're eating too many nuts. It's, it's all the things, right? We listen to all the voices. And we just become more confused, right? Like, who's ever been overwhelmed researching your health? <laughs> right? You kind of feel like an idiot. I'm just going to say, I did. I felt like, and I was like, I should know this. I should, I should know how to do this. And there are a lot of them who say, well, if my method isn't working for you, uh, you're not doing it right. Oh, yeah. right. But are you fasting while doing a headstand? Because <laughs> I think that really is the problem. And ultimately, I just felt heartbroken. Because when I found keto, the thought that was most healing to me was, oh, I'm not broken. I'm not broken, I just was doing the wrong thing. And now that I'm doing the right thing, I, I, and then, oh, no, I was wrong. I am broken. I'm definitely broken. There's something wrong with me because everyone else is successful. Why can't I be successful, right? And then uh, the four horsemen of the weight, lock, weight loss apocalypse arrive. The drift. I don't know if you guys know the drift. It's like, uh, I'll have sweeteners on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, every other hour, just kind of drift. And right? You don't even notice you're going there. Then the flail and bounce. That one is when you're like looking, looking, looking for a solution, any one, a penny for a solution. And, but you can't, you don't stick to any. You're like, I'm carnivore for 24 hours, but then I watched a YouTube video and they said vegan keto was the way to go. So now I'm vegan keto, but tomorrow I heard about the MCT cleanse and I'm gonna do that one. And don't do that one. Um, and then sardines, uh, sardines and, and which are a fabulous food. You can eat mine. Um, but I, uh, you know, it's all these things. And it's not that, the thing is the problem. It's that you don't do it long enough to see if it works. So you're just using it as an opportunity to reinforce your negative thoughts, right? Sad truth, negative thought circulation is comfortable for our brains. If there's something wrong with you, it makes you safer because you're in control of it, even if you're doing it wrong. It's just part of human nature. Can you say that again? No. Um, <laughs> that we just go around in a circle because if something, if you can make you the problem, then you could be the solution. The fact that you're not the solution just confirms that you're a terrible person, which feels kind of comfortable to a lot of us. It's messed up. It's messed up, but it's true. All right. Uh, the double down paralysis. What I'm doing isn't working, so I should do it harder. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. And then the destroyer of worlds. The effort. <laughs> the scale isn't moving. Why do I bother? I can explain a little bit of why you bother. I think most of you realize what 
like at, at like a week or two later, like, oh, now I remember why I didn't do this, right? Or a month later, or a year later. You might be like, oh, that was a very bad idea. But in the t at the moment, why is that? P we did, uh, some of you might not be compulsive overeaters, but I'm going to guess a lot of y'all are, okay? And, or at the very least, are people who use food to fill an emotional need. Honestly, I think everyone does that to some degree. It's just how much damage you're doing with it that really defines how disordered it is. And when we are sad and disappointed and we feel bad, food is comforting. It does feel better for a second. So never feel like you are a bad person because you went to a comfort source. You should think this is not going to fix it and you should not do it, but like it doesn't mean anything about you that's negative. It just means you made a poor decision in that moment. So this is how we engage in the loss and regain spin cycle, right? We feel bad, we feel disappointed, F it, eat some more, gain some weight, come back over and over and over again. And like my client, Tammy, she lost some good weight on keto, but she wasn't quite happy with where she got. My client, Lisa, she lost a lot of weight and she got her blood sugars from the 180s fasting to the 80s. I mean, that's amazing. She is a Woman's World Magazine cover model. Um, but she thought, okay, this is, this is where I can get to, right? So there's a point at which the weight loss gets hard. Hopefully that's not a news flash. Weight loss is hard for most people. Um, and in the real world, so the, this is kind of color coded. You can see that all the people in red out of a, out of a, a group of people regain the weight plus more. <laughs> so the majority of people who lose weight will regain that weight and add some friends. A small portion will lose the weight and retain most of that weight loss, and it's a, the smallest fraction that keep all the weight off. So this is hard, and we have this idea in our society that you lose the weight and you get to the finish line and it's like you're a different person with a different life uh, and, and you never have to think about it again. And that's part of that regain cycle. We only know binge and diet. Binge and diet. We don't know how to live a healthy life. Now, a lot of you do. Don't take it personally if you're like, wait, I do. Okay, good job. That you can help others, right? But I still have my old wiring in my brain. Do you, I don't like that. I wish we could, like, can we uninstall and reinstall? Like the, no, it's in there. It's like the space junk is just floating in the back of my brain, right? And I just have to say, shut it. Shut it all the time. And no, we're going to the new version, right? Oh, all right. I am not food shaming anyone with this, but I wanted to point this out because it's a thought that's been occurring to me while on this cruise. It is either genius or cruel that we are having this conference on a cruise ship. <laughs> I took this picture. I, did not, I don't do pictures of people. I don't body shame, but I do plate pictures. <laughs> uh, this is not a member of the low carb cruise. I was sitting in the coffee bar the other day. And I watched, and every person that walked, it was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so it's an hour before dinner, right? Every person walking by me had at least two desserts on their little plate, at least two. Nobody had one. Notice it's a big plate. It looks lonely if you only have one, right? So this one was four, and, and that's, the, that's, that's where we live. Yes, the cruise ship is kind of a little bit of an intensifier, but the world isn't so different. We live in a cruise ship world where we're surrounded by these things that call our name. And at the same time, okay, I saw this and I was shocked. This is Hugh Jackman in 2000 
playing a role. Remember when this came out, we were like, he is a machine. He is awesome. Look what he is now. Okay, I have put some Ozempic up there, but we all know there's probably some other drugs involved. <laughs> but I am going to say that we are in a world that drives us insane. Because on the one hand, we are presented with just a plethora of delicious food options that act on our brain like a drug. And then we're told, this is, well, I mean, some version of this is the healthy way to look. No, like, he's healthier in the slightly chubbier picture, right? And so we're offered things like Ozempic. Ozem I'm, I don't know about any of you, but when the Ozempic news started coming out, I had a little bit of uh, an emotional reaction. Not because I'm against it, but because I was tempted, right? Who here was a little bit tempted to get a drug intervention to, yeah, to lose a little bit more weight. Yep. And I did not like that about myself, but I'm human and I still want an easy button. And that's just the way life goes. My, my better angels uh, called to me and said, you don't want to do that. I don't even like taking vitamins. <laughs> so anyway, um, so you have to stop the insanity. I was hoping people would get the reference. Your children will not. You've got to get real about what matters to you and why. Here's what I'm saying. That initial weight loss you had to get from unhealthy to pretty healthy, your body wants that weight off bad, right? And you have to evaluate, what do I really care about? Longevity, health span, metabolic health, cognitive health, the size of my pants, like what matters to you? So the first question you always have to say is, are you metabolically healthy? So there are, there are a lot of markers of metabolic health. We know most of them, you know, blood pressure, HDL, um, your triglycerides, your glucose, and you want, and your waist size, and you want these markers to be within the metabolically healthy range. You want your fasting insulin to be in a, in a good range. You want your C-peptide to be in a good range. So these are the markers of metabolic health. Are you metabolically healthy? Are you still obese, right? There's a difference between being a little fluffy and being obese. It's very clear that being obese is related to a lot of health problems. Do you still have quite a bit of visceral fat, organ fat, these are things that are going to harm you actively. But does having a little bit of extra floof reduce your lifespan? So this is a chart that's telling you all-cause mortality. That's how dying you are likely to be, right? How, what, <laughs> what degree of dyingness you possess, okay? So technical terms, it's me. Right. And the women have the lowest relative risk at 35% body fat. Am I telling you that it is healthier to have 35% body fat than 30% body fat? I am not. I am not telling you that everybody should aim for that necessarily. However, I am telling you that that voice in your head that is telling you at 35% body fat, which, you know, is a little chubby, um, is 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 that you're still doing it just for your health when you're trying to get from 35 to 25 percent body fat it's 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 up in the air now is being more active having more muscle mass going to make you live longer and healthier a hundred thousand percent by the way it was 22 percent for men just in case you want to know um, are you active? So on this chart, I keep feeling like I have to point it at it. You guys can see. On this chart, we've got, so the, the first category on the left are sort of normal weight people. Uh, the next one is slightly overweight. And then we've got all the way to obesity. So you can see if you look at the, uh, I don't like BMI, but that's how this chart is done. The sort of BMI that we would call overweight, not obese, but overweight. If you're very active, you notice the relative risk line there is zero, 
right? That means that a active, slightly overweight person is just as unlikely to die. <laughs> Not that you're gonna live forever, but their, their likelihood of, of early mortality is the same as a thin person. So if you are stuck, I'm not telling you to just give up, no. But what I am telling you is, please stop telling yourself lies. That it's just, I just care about my health. Okay, it's this, you're doing the same thing to yourself that, that people, when they look at overweight people, what do they say? I'm so worried about your health. No, you're worried about their body. And it's okay to want to be thinner. I am not at all resembling the remarks I made in this, in this comment, right? I also would like to be 10 pounds thinner than I am. I don't, I don't hide that. I, however, I am honest with the fact that that takes more work than I'm willing to do right now. And if you're lying to yourself about the effort you're willing to expend, you're going to be miserable. So you ha if you decide that you want it, you have to back it up with actions. You have to stop complaining about the efforts that you're not getting by the actions you're not taking, right? But I have a caveat to that. And you have to stop being mad at yourself about the actions you're not taking. Your life is worth more than the size of your pants. And the way you are treating yourself, some of you, is unacceptable. Unacceptable. This is my personality, like all of my personality. This, if you can't read it, things I fixed. The little bit I'm still working on, and this is the graph of why I'm completely unacceptable as a human, right? We are mean to ourselves. The, just the, the, the reality, your body is the intersection of your biology and your choices. That's it, right? But we didn't all start with the same neighborhood. We didn't all start with the same advantages. We didn't all start at the same place. I, you weren't born to multimillionaire parents. Are you still mad about that? Hopefully not, right? So why are you mad that this is harder for you than your friend Susie? We need to exhibit the right kind of stress on our body. So some of us who've given up, we're not putting in any stress. We're not putting in any effort. We're like, ah, F it. You gotta have the right amount of stress. You've gotta push yourself hard enough, you'll feel a sense of pride, but if you push yourself too far, you'll go into overwhelm. So it's about finding your own appropriate balance level of effort. I gotta speed up here. So I did in fact decide to put in more effort because when I lost the 60 pounds and said, I don't wanna stay in the 200, I don't wanna do that. I did continue to lose weight and I did eventually get down 100 pounds. And that last part was much harder than the first part, much, much harder. And Tammy, oh, what happened? She also lost quite a bit of weight, right? She said, I thought it was my hormones. We worked on a plan together, she fixed it. Lisa was like, I've done a lot, this is probably the best I can do. And she also became kind of a beast in the gym. So. so I had to separate the fact from the fiction to get clear on a lot of this stuff. I'm gonna do this part really fast. The dogma is keeping you stuck. Am I saying that everybody is wrong? No, but I'm saying they all can't be right. I had to get into a different mindset. I am not broken. My approach is just out of alignment with my goals. And I had to get clear that I had additional goals. I couldn't pretend to have goals that I wasn't acting on. That's just torture. So I said, hey, I'm in a very different body than I was when I was metabolically unhealthy. I'm metabolically healthy, my body acts different. Um, what got me here won't get me there. I have to know what works 
on a metabolically healthier person to lose weight, not just what worked on a metabolic unhealthy person to lose weight. And I had made some mistakes in the beginning. Beginners always make mistakes. What were they and how do I fix them? I, was my, I had to say, I am my own expert. And uh, is my struggle with a plan or is it with adherence? So this is an important point for everybody. Um, do you struggle to know what to do or do you struggle to do it? They're different issues, or both. They're different issues, right? If you aren't at least following the plan you set up for yourself, the answer is pretty simple and straightforward. Follow the plan you set up for yourself. Give it a chance. If it doesn't work, pivot. Pivot. <laughs> okay? But don't just keep looking. Don't plan shop until you've confirmed it does, doesn't fit. Try the dress on. Don't just buy it and take it home. If it doesn't fit, put it back, right? I had to critically evaluate what I've been taught along the way. I see problems in the community. I don't see problems with the things I'm talking about, but with the execution, I'll say. I'm not against fasting, but I see a lot of problems in the fasting community. I think fasting is awesome, but I see some people using fasting to um, condone their eating disorder. I see some people never really actually learning to eat properly. I only lose weight when I fast, so I just fast and then not fast, and you're like, hey, welcome to binge eating. Um, they totally ignore the sarcopenic crisis. Women, you're very likely to become sarcopenic in your older years. If you under eat protein and you don't use your muscles, you will have some really unhappy later years. Men too, but it happens more to women because women don't eat as much protein and don't move their bodies as much. So too much fasting could get in the way of that. You might not have enough opportunities to get all your nutrients in. You also, um, the other thing I see is people just talking about fasting is the only way to get autophagy. It's not the only way. Exercise is actually more efficient. I'm not saying fasting isn't important. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. But don't get stuck in something that's not working for you. Misunderstanding scale fluctuations. The scale goes up and down. It doesn't mean you gained or lost body fat. But it does. It's the number one reason people go F it. That's stupid because nothing was happening. It's just the scale going up and down because water weight shifts. Um, we have the hamster wheel of recency attention. I ate a salad yesterday. I gained two pounds today. Salad makes me gain weight. No, 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 OK. All right. Um, I'm not saying you have to eat salad. I'm just saying. Uh, oh, how about this one? Not working out because it makes the scale go up. You can also amputate a limb. That will also make the scale go down. So, OK. Um, and you have to uncover the truths. Oh, I'm going to have to rush. I'm taking an extra two. All right. Um, fact versus fiction. One, uh, you can't suppress your metabolism through keto and fasting. That is untrue. Your metabolism doesn't care. Metabolic adaptation is real. If you eat too little for too long for too often, your metabolic rate goes down. You can fix it, but this is why I pulse my attempts to lose weight. Um, low protein on keto is fine because keto is muscle sparing. Keto is only muscle sparing in the presence of cancer cachexia because it is an anti-inflammatory diet. So yes, if you have cancer, keto can definitely be muscle sparing. You still need an appropriate amount of protein on keto. Um, it's a hundred, by the way, I fell for that one too, so don't feel bad. Um, ketosis equals automatic fat loss. Ketosis equals ketosis. Um, less carbs always equals more fat loss. Extreme carb cutting is one of many methods for fat loss. Uh, it's all about clean eating. Tolerance for foods is highly individualized. Um, less eating time is better. Like, oh, if you're new to this three times a day, then two times is better, but one time is much better, and then alternate fasting, alternate day fasting is even better. No. Eating the appropriate amount of times for your body. Yes, snacking all day. Bad. Grazing, bad. Don't do those things. But three times a day for some people is actually a sweet spot. Not everybody. So you have to know your goal, your plan, your strategy. So step one, decide that you want to put in the effort. 
If you don't want to put in the effort, stop beating yourself up. Autumn is going to have a very important talk later. I think you're clever some of this, yeah? Yeah. That's okay. Um, know your body. What are your particular health challenges? And um, what gets measured gets managed. I know a lot of you don't like to track. Do it for a little while. If you don't know why it's not working, you need some data. Just think of it as an experiment, okay? You can no longer afford these things. To chase your tail, to wallow, to get stuck in dogma, to be loyal to your diet even if it's not working. I know we're a community. They will love you. They will still love you if you have a Brussels sprout. It's okay. <laughs> Listening to anyone who says it's the same for everyone. Prioritizing short-term fixes over long-term gains and benefits. Mindless eating, either overeating or undereating. Um, the need for speed. Right? I am unacceptable. I must get rid of this immediately. And then you spin for like 20 or 30 years. I don't know that pattern at all. Um, and the unwillingness to sharpen the saw. So I'm just going to close with that, which is sometimes you got to take a breather, take a break, and think, how do I fix this and invest the time? Robert Sykes today after me, I think, is going to be talking a little bit about nutritional periodization. I don't have time to get into it in this talk because I'm already over time, but nutritional periodization is not just for bodybuilders. It's the thing that helped me. It's the thing I actually teach in my programs. And um, I, so I'll, I'll hand it off to Robert for that part. But letting yourself have periods of effort, periods of break, giving yourself different seasons through the year to experience different amounts of eating and different approaches, and to get to practice feeling like you get to be in maintenance. These are wonderful things. So I think I'm leaving in a good spot for Robert and for Amber. And thank you for letting me try to do a 45-minute talk at 30.